Okay, so what happens when you actually get to the hospital? Well, labor and delivery is on the second floor. You'll see where it is tonight. No matter time of day or night, you can go to the visitor entrance. There's a security guard there who will let you in. You'll go up the escalator, labor and deliveries right at the very top. You'll ring the buzzer because it is a locked unit and then they'll let you in and the triage assessment is as soon as you walk through the door. Most people will come through triage as a means to figure out if you belong to be in the hospital or not, right? If you come with what I call a positive towel sign, meaning you have a towel between your legs <laughs> that's wet, <laughs> probably you'll go straight to a room. If you come and the baby's head is between the legs, probably you'll go to a room, but everybody else will go through triage. There are four bays with curtains and a stretcher. It's not a huge area, so they only allow one person to come in with you. So your entire entourage will need to wait in the, wa in the waiting room. Um, and then you'll meet a nurse there who will put you on the monitor. There's a monitor for the baby's heartbeat. There's a monitor for your contractions so you can stop timing them. <laughs> We'll get a set of vital signs, blood pressure, temperature, breathing rate, um, and uh, heart rate. And then, you know, and then we'll see what's your cervix dilated to? Is your baby happy and healthy? Are you happy and healthy? And we'll make a plan. And usually that is not a long time. Usually we can do that in a matter of minutes and get you to a room, okay? So then when we say, okay, yes, it is time for you to be here. Usually in the triage room, they'll go ahead and draw your blood and they'll put a little saline lock in. Everybody gets a saline lock. What is that? It's a little port that's an IV, but it doesn't need to be attached to anything unless you're ready for your epidural or unless you need antibiotics. And if you need antibiotics, it's just attached to you for a short time and then we un unattach it and then you're free to move about the cabin. Okay. Um, monitoring. Does that mean you're strapped in the bed? No. We have portable monitors. We have wireless monitors. We know that upright women have faster labors. So we encourage you just because there's a stretcher or a bed in the room, that doesn't mean that you're confined to it. You're not on bed rest. You're a healthy mom having a healthy birth and you can be up and around. We do have birth balls in every single room. We have peanut balls in every single room. We have rockers in every single room. We have showers in every single room and you're welcome to use any of it. The bed goes into a ton of different positions. We've got squat bars, you know, that you can, that you can use. So, um, use all of our tools. And then for visitors, right now there's not a flu season um, limitation. There's always talk about this, so this may change. Don't hold me to it. But, um, you know, five visitors on labor and delivery. Um, if you're in one of the small rooms, they may ask that only three people be with you during the birth and that the other two wait in the waiting room. There's not a ton of seating, I'll be quite honest, and you can look at it and see. But generally, I say labor is not a spectator sport. It really isn't. And if, you know, if truly, if you wouldn't poo in front of somebody, then they probably shouldn't be at your birth, right? So pain management. The really great thing about physicians and midwives is that we support women on every end of this continuum. Truly, we do. Um, and there's probably some of you, second baby, third baby, anybody like not first time mom? Okay, so again, everybody just kind of has their own way of coping and we support you. And these go in order of least interventional to most interventional. So I always like to make that distinction. So unmedicated, as the name suggests, you have nothing. You have no IV medications for pain medicine. You have no epidural for pain management. If this is something you wanna do, again, we support you. We have an amazing team of midwives and physicians who are there for you all the way, but this is hard work. I always like in natural childbirth, or I actually don't like that term because like, if the baby comes out, it's natural. Um, unmedicated childbirth. 
is that it's hard and you wouldn't run a marathon without training and you shouldn't try to have an unmedicated childbirth without training. It is a physical toll on your heart, on your lungs, on your muscles, on all of your tissues. It's hard. I had my daughter unmedicated. I don't say that to gloat, but just to tell you as someone who's done it, again, it's hard work and you need to prepare for that. You need a doula. You need childbirth education. You need to be in good physical shape. You need your 30 minutes of cardio every day. I did it. I did dance classes. I ran. I walked. I weight lifted. You need to be in shape if you are going to do unmedicated childbirth. Um, but we support you. And all those things like the showers, the peanut balls, the yoga balls, the squat bars, use it all. It's all there for you. It will help you. It's amazing. And find your thing and, and roll with it. You can bring music. You can bring your, your oil diffuser. Really, the only thing you can't bring to the hospital is open flame because oxygen tanks. But so no candles, no incense, but pretty much anything else, we're down. If you have specific questions, you can always let us know. We can go over it with you during your prenatal visits. But if we can help you achieve that unmedicated birth you want, just tell us what your thoughts are and we'll try to roll with it. IV pain medications, next step up. So if you are kind of one of those women that's like, I just kind of need to take the edge off of this. This is really starting to not be fun anymore. I don't want the epidural, but I also, I need something. We have IV pain medications. These are narcotics. They will make you a little drowsy. They will make you a little loopy. They will make you a little sleepy. And in turn, a little bit of that, yes, does go to the baby. They too will be a little drowsy, a little sleepy. Not at dangerous levels, but you'll see them just kind of like, you know, take a little nap on the monitor and it's fine. We don't use these though once you hit about six centimeters dilation, five or six. And again, very situationally dependent, but usually five to six, because again, at that point, you're rounding the corner to having a baby. And we don't need a baby to come out who's just had a shot of narcotic. We need them to come out, be ready to go, be ready to cry, breathe on their own, do their own thing. So these are really good for that kind of early part. So let's say you're being induced. Let's say you came to the hospital a little earlier. You're kind of right at that four to five centimeter mark. We can try a narcotic in your IV and see if that helps take the edge off. I tell people if you kind of end up as that one's wearing off, you're like, I need another one. I need another one. It might be time to talk about the epidural a little bit, but if you just needed to kind of come off the ceiling to kind of just keep going, then that's a good use of the IV pain medications. If you have any allergies to any agents, if your baby is not looking, as Stacy said, happy and healthy on the monitor, we're going to tell you this is not a safe option for you. So don't worry about that. We would never endanger you or your baby, but if everything looks okay, that's a great option. Nitrous oxide, we're doing nitrous. It's really, really great. I'm glad that we're doing it at Inova Alexandria. If anyone has ever watched Call the Midwife and they're talking about gas and air, that's nitrous. It's been around for eons. And you take the mask and you inhale. You are inhaling nitrous oxide. Again, it does not knock you out. It is not a pain medication. Nitrous oxide is an anxiety reducer. So I have women come back to me postpartum and they're like, that didn't help my pain. I'm like, I didn't tell you it was going to help your pain. It helps you not care about your pain. So again, it kind of calms the anxiety down. It takes the edge off. As that contraction builds, you put the mask to your face. You take a deep inhalation. You will get a little high for a couple of seconds, and then as the mask falls away from your face, that contraction is ending. So again, you are still conscious, you are still upright. This is not an epidural, but it's also not gonna take away the pain of labor. It helps you better manage that pain and it helps you become less anxious. This is an awesome tool for women who are having an unmedicated birth and need something to help them get through the finish line. When you hit about that seven to eight centimeter mark, and you feel like you're about to meet your maker, um, this is when you can really use the nitrous and it will help you. It will be really, really helpful. And it just helps you calm down a little bit and it helps you get through. Con con um, also, if you end up having an unmedicated birth and we need to do like some stitches or some repair work afterwards, you can breathe the nitrous while we're doing the repair. This is not good to use straight from the jump and go all the way through. So if you're one centimeter, we're not gonna give you a nitrous oxide tank to use for like 36 hours. This is for active labor plus, everybody's like, darn. This is good for active labor plus, okay? So five plus-ish centimeters or that transitional time when you're about eight centimeters dilated and pushing through without any other pain medicine on board, this is when it's helpful, okay? And then the epidural. This is kind of, again, our, our biggest gun intervention. A lot of women in the United States have them and we support you. So, you know, no one gets a gold star for doing any one of these things or not doing any one of these things. Healthy mom, healthy baby, that's our goal. The epidural is regional anesthesia. It is placed by an anesthesiologist who is an MD or a certified registered nurse anesthetist who is an advanced practice nurse just like we are, who has training in, in 
anesthetizing people. So they go ahead and they put this epidural in your back. I don't think we have them. No, we yeah, yeah, we took the picture out. Um, but this goes in your back and it is something that is continually dosed. So you hear people like my epidural ran out. Well, we can put more medicine in it. The like anesthesiologist, an it's like an IV, but it's just going into a different space. Medicine can be put in it. You also have PCA, um, which is a pump that you control. So there's like a kind of a basal rate or a continuous rate that you get, and you can dose yourself up if you need. Again, there's limits on that. We're not going to allow you to harm yourself, but that can be dosed with different medications at different times for different reasons. The amount and type of medicine that you would need for a vaginal birth versus, say, a cesarean are very different. That epidural can be dosed accordingly to go wherever we need it to go and how high we need it to go to keep you numb and happy. As a dear friend and colleague of mine who is an anesthesiologist said, nothing, none of this is going to take everything away. Birth is participatory is what he would always say. And he's right. An epidural, you're not going to like fall asleep and wake up holding a baby. Nitrous, that's not going to happen either. Yeah, this isn't like the 1940s where we're drugging you and dragging them out. So you are still going to be pushing. You are still going to feel pressure. You are still going to feel this kid come down and through your pelvis. So again, Realistic expectations for all of these methods. Are you going to be number with the epidural? Absolutely. As opposed to going unmedicated or with IV meds, but none of these are going to get you a pain-free birth. If that's how you interpret it afterwards, that's fantastic. But we, make, we don't make that promise. So again, just kind of be aware, all of this, you're still gonna be pushing, you're still gonna feel some pressure, you're still working just as hard, no matter which category you fall into. You're still gonna be pushing this kid out or you're still gonna be having a C-section, both of which are hugely sacrificial and hard work, no matter which way you cut it. So does anybody have any, we usually get some questions on this, things that people have heard, Googled, YouTubed, anything that anybody can think of with pain management options? I always liken an epidural, go ahead. Usually you don't need nitrous after the epidural. Yeah, sometimes you need nitrous to get an epidural and that's an option. Um, I always liken epidural to dental work, right? Because it's the same kind of medicine. It's the same family of, of medicine. It's, um, you know, Novocaine for, for the dentist. It's lidocaine, ropivacaine, bupivacaine for an epidural. They're, they're all canes. You get dental work done, you still feel the dentist in your mouth. It's still uncomfortable, right? But the sharpness is gone. So that's what I think an epidural is good for. And one other point I wanted to make about the nitrous is you can't have nitrous on when you're in the shower. You can't have nitrous on if you're on a birth ball. You get a little loopy and you get unsteady on your feet. So you have to be either in the rocker or seated on the bed or somewhere where you're safe. Go ahead. So I always say if you buy it, it should work right? So if it's not working, and there are times when it doesn't work, some people will say that the epidural space can be segmented like sections of an orange, and there can be nerves that they don't reach the first time that they put an epidural in. And if that's the case, they can pull back on the catheter, they can add a little volume, or they can just redo the epidural. And sometimes the third time's the charm, but it doesn't always work the first time. And it's good to have that expectation. Go ahead. Thank you. That's a great point. Yes, that is correct. Yes. Great question. So the IV pain medications, yes. Um, as any narcotics, if anybody's ever taken fentanyl, Percocet, et cetera, for any kind of surgery or dental work, nausea, vomiting, although arguably that also comes with the labor, but that's generally what it is along with sedation. The nitrous oxide, you are gonna feel a little loopy. If it's used continuously, but this is usually more for like a free flow, like you're not taking it away, putting it back, taking it away. If it's a kind of a more continuous hit, um, then you can also get nauseated with nitrous oxide. And then the epidural, Thankfully, regionally is where you see all of your action. It kind of bathes, but it can cause the most common side effect of an epidural is a dropped blood pressure which in turn can make baby a little unhappy sometimes. We have medications to combat that. We give you fluids preemptively to kind of strike that, but that's what we're watching for. But as far as um, sedation to you or baby, no. Dropped blood pressure to you, yes. Um, and we can combat that as well. And one of the side effects of a dropped blood pressure is again, nausea. Right. So. 
And for those of you who didn't hear her question, once you have an epidural, you cannot get up and walk around. You hear about walking epidurals. That's not an option here. You will be getting your narcotic. You will be getting your anesthesia and you will be in the bed for your safety. Okay, so, so you had your early labor, you had your active labor. Now you're fully dilated and it's time to push. So what to expect when it's time to push? Well, one of the advantages of being unmedicated is that we don't have to tell you what to do. Your body just knows and it's so crazy. It's called Ferguson's reflex and it just kicks in and you reflexively start pushing and we don't have to coach you or guide you or count to 10. You just push, you know what to do. Um, and so if you're unmedicated, your body will tell you what position you need to be in. And as midwives, we respect that. We don't have any requirements for how you need to be positioned for birth. Okay, so whether it's you wanna be on hands and knees, a lot of women that are unmedicated just instinctually get on their hands and knees. Whether you wanna squat, whether you want to be standing, whether you want to be side-lying, whether you, um, you know, however you want to do it, and we'll support you with that. The uh, benefit of having an epidural, conversely, um, is that you don't have that reflex, and so we are able to let you have passive descent, is what we call it, or laboring down. We put you in positions that open your pelvis, your uterus does a lot of the work of pushing without you knowing it. And then when it's time to push, you don't have, you don't have to push for as long, right? Because your body's already done a lot of the work. Um, so, you know, benefits to both sides there. So then, um, you know, we're, I have a lot of people that say, should I write a birth plan? And I always say to them, you know, a lot of the things that you're gonna wanna put on the birth plan, we just do standardly. You don't have to tell me that you don't want an episiotomy routinely. And I will promise you, we don't, want to cut one we, we don't do that, okay? It's called evidence-based practice. We allow your body to stretch. We baby your bottom with lubrication and warm compresses. So you don't have to put that on a birth plan and ask us to do that, because that's what we do routinely. As a standard of care, we delay cord clamping. You might hear about that. I don't need a birth plan to tell me you need to delay cord clamping, because that's what I do normally. Um, and then if you do have any preferences, like you know, their partner cut the cord or your partner doesn't want to cut the cord, um, you know, those are all things that we can talk about in the moment. If you do have specifics, you know, I really want my baby to be born according to this song. Um, you know, <laughs> that's fine. We can accommodate. We can accommodate, like, whatever you want to do. So we're open. If you have any questions about your birth plan, let's talk about it in the office so that, you know, you can be reassured. You know, if you want to put on your birth plan, I want to have water birth. I will tell you that we don't offer that. There are no tubs, okay? Um, and then, so you're pushing, you're pushing. Average first time moms without an epidural, it's like 57 minutes, right? So don't expect, like in the movies, you push a couple times and the kid comes out. Um, you're gonna work hard. If you're doing it right, you're gonna be sweating whether you have an epidural or not. It is hard work. You just can't imagine how hard you have to push to push out a baby. And so we'll be there to encourage you. This is one of the times that the midwives will try their very best to not leave your side is when you're pushing. And we really try to be a continuous presence and source of encouragement and guidance. Um, and then with an epidural, you could push two hours, three hours, four hours. It's a workout. So we'll be putting you in lots of different positions if you have an epidural and, you know, just kind of helping to open your pelvis up and just really cheering you on. I think one of the midwives compared it. Who's that, um, the biggest loser coach? Jill somebody? Oh yeah, her, I don't know her name. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, that's who we are while you're pushing. Yes. Um, and then normal birth, the head comes out, the shoulder, the 
front shoulder comes out, then the back shoulder comes out, and then I'll just say to you, reach down. And you'll reach down and you'll take your baby and you'll bring your baby up close to you. And your baby will be skin to skin. And we will wait for the baby to breathe. Some babies breathe right away, some take a minute. That's okay. We'll dry the baby off so the baby doesn't get cold because wet babies get cold. We'll put a fresh blanket on over both of you and we'll wait for the cord to, you know, to pulse. And after a time, um, we'll clamp the cord and we'll offer for your partner to cut the cord. And then, you'll, that's, the baby's yours. You can bring that baby right to the breast, okay? Um, if the baby's healthy and if you're healthy, there's no reason to interrupt that process. There's no reason to take the baby to the warmer or give the baby a bath. You know, your baby's going to lick and paint its smell all over your chest so that it knows that that's where home is. And that's going to support breastfeeding. We like for you to breastfeed in the first hour if you're going to breastfeed. And so the nurse will help you with that. All of our nurses are baby friendly nurses, which means that they've had additional training to support lactation. And so they're all equipped to help you with that breastfeeding. And they all put a huge um, emphasis on it in that they don't want to take that baby away from you to do the tasks that they have to do of measuring the baby and figuring out how much the baby weighs giving the erythromycin ointment or the shot of vitamin K, they honor the golden hour. They're very good about it. Okay, so after the golden hour is over, sure, we can weigh the baby, but there's no, there's no hurry. Um, what does baby friendly mean? Well, it's 10 different steps that the hospital had to go through to get certification. It's a World Health Organization initiative to support lactation. And so what does that mean? That means that all the babies stay with their moms if they're healthy. They all stay with their moms. We don't have them go to the nursery at nighttime because um, we know that if they stay with their moms, their moms are more likely to have better breastfeeding outcomes. Um, and then we have lactation consultants who will see you every single day. There's a breastfeeding class every single day and we'll make sure that you're confident breastfeeding is established before you go home. If you elect to bottle feed, we will respect your wishes and you won't get harassed, okay? If you know that you wanna use a pacifier, they don't supply them for you. The recommendation is not to introduce a pacifier until the baby's three weeks old, and so they don't even give them out. So if you know you're gonna to wanna to use one in the hospital, you'll need to bring it, put it on your packing list.